you've had a good experience around the Christmas holiday. We're at the end of the year, and we prayed with each other and for each other that these days just now, which have been difficult and trying and challenging, still we can see God's hand in our lives. Today's service is more informal. There won't be somebody standing behind the pulpit. It'll be done a little differently as we come to the close of our year, still in the Christmas season. Let's begin with prayer. We say, O oh Lord, once again, come, Lord Jesus, into our world and bring your joy. We've been saying that throughout this month and during Advent. You have brought joy to us who worship you, who has brought joy through the angel songs. Some have been singing the carols in our church for 60, 70, or more years. Not only are they familiar, but they are beautiful and well heard in our hearts of faith. We ask you, Lord, to bring joy to children, to teenagers, to young and middle and older adults. Be with those who are struggling for various reasons. Perhaps it's illness or sadness or plans that have not gone as they hoped. But as we enter soon into a new year, we pray that we will rest assured in your grace and your joy, your peace and your hope. We thank you, Lord, for providing love to us in the person of Jesus, who does indeed bring us joy and gladness for our everyday life, every day. Lord, we pray that as we come to the time of worshiping you this day, that our hearts will be tuned in to your love and grace, and we will experience the filling of the Holy Spirit. Lord, with all heaven and nature, we sing and shout and speak about our joy, our joy in Christ. We pray this in his holy name. Amen. reading of the gospel from the second chapter of the book of Luke. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy. They offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. 
Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see the Messiah until the death of the Messiah came. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms. He praised God. And this is what he said. Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace. It's according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's mother and father were amazed about what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your heart also. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. Then as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came, and she began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. says, a sword will pierce your soul too. With those words from today's gospel lesson, Simeon placed a small cloud over a big day. In keeping with the traditions of Judaism, Mary and Joseph had brought the baby Jesus to the temple for his dedication. It was then and there that the prophet Simeon had said some beautiful words over Mary's infant son. But then the tone took a turn when Simeon said that this child would grow up to cause conflict, and that because Mary was Jesus' mother, a sword would pierce her own soul too, all of which did come to pass, just as Simeon said. Jesus did grow up to cause much conflict, and a sword of sorrow did pierce Mary's soul when she suffered the sadness of watching her son die on the cross. But while Jesus' death might have been the worst of the sword that Simeon saw in Mary's future, it wasn't the first of the sword that Simeon saw. That may have come years earlier when, as an adolescent, Jesus left his parents when they took him to the temple without telling them where he would be. Mary, once she had found him, had words with her son. We've been looking everywhere for you. Why have you treated us this way? Now, there's a very human moment for the Holy Family when she says those words. And perhaps it is a small wound from the sword that Simeon said would pierce Mary's own soul. Then, of course, there was that time when Jesus 
was teaching his followers and someone said to him, Rabbi, your mother and your brothers are outside. They need to speak to you. Well, in response, Jesus said something like, excuse me, my family needs me. I'll be right back. Or did he say that? No, as you recall, rather than responding as we might expect, Jesus said something far different. Far different than we or his disciples would likely figure he would ever say to his parents. This is what Jesus said. Who is my mother? Who are my brothers and sisters? My family members are those who do the will of my Father in heaven. And one imagines that the sword that Simeon said would pierce Mary's soul wounded her spirit a little more that day. And then, of course, came the cross. You know, Jesus sat down with and stood up for the wrong people, often enough that he made the right people nervous and anxious that they had him arrested, convicted, and crucified. And the sword that Simeon said would pierce Mary's soul, it did indeed, just as Simeon said it would, making Mary's family for her both a source of pain and joy, which makes it a quiet reminder for all of us of something many of us already know, which is that the family which loves us most dearly can also be the family that wounds us most deeply. What Simeon called a sword in the soul is what I somewhere along the way have come to call helpless love. We are helpless to manage the lives of those we love, which is it should be. But we are also helpless to distance ourselves from the pain which can sometimes come to and from those we love the most. And no matter how hard we work at establishing healthy boundaries between our lives and the lives of those whom we love, boundaries in the family are, as one wise soul once put it, less than an ever-changing, never-changing brick wall and more like a growing bunch of crepe myrtle. The news any of us have to deal with is that in our own careful thinking, and in our own ardent praying around often complex questions, how do we best love one another in families? So, as we reflect on the early and later stories of Jesus and family, we can ask some of the questions for ourselves and those whom we love, such as when does supportive love become unhealthy and enabling? On the other hand, when does tough love need to lighten up? When do difficult conversations need to be had straight on? On the other hand, when is the difficult conversation which needs to be held or had not worth the risk of rupture or what, but, what may be caused by it? And what about holding on and letting go? The book of Ecclesiastes says that there's a time for both, but it doesn't offer any guidance concerning how or when to do the other. Families take almost as many shapes in our world as they took in the Bible. But one thing almost all families of every shape and size hold in common is a perpetually repeated, never-ending convergence of joy and pain, simplicity and complexity, which is not unlike Mary's life with her unusual son, Jesus. A life of joy, no doubt, but joy bruised by the sword Simeon saw, which makes the holy family just like every other normal or ordinary family. And how is that so? Because the family who loves us most dearly can be the one who wounds us most deeply. That's why it's so important for all of us, no matter what the safe shape or size of our family, to practice in our families the daily virtues of kindness, respect, courtesy, patience, gentleness, truthfulness. It means accepting those whom we love to be who they are and what they may become, who they may think they should be, which may mean relinquishing any kind of leverage we think we hold over people we love. To practice in our families the daily virtues of kindness, patience, respect, courtesy, gentleness, and truthfulness, that might also mean to choose to refuse to talk about our family members in their absence in any other way than when we talk about them in their presence. And, if we will, to practice paying mindful attention to one another by looking at each other more frequently. You know, more carefully and intentionally than we might look at the screens on our cell phones. Well, can we do that? 
we can with practice, none of which will make our family life perfect or painless, but all of which put together will make our families more safe and healing. A strong and true gift of grace in a world which sometimes seems to grow less that way with each passing day. So here we are, a couple of days past Christmas, when, if we could, we'd likely be spending extra time with those whom we love and who love us. This year, though, being able to gather in the same space has been hard to do. Nevertheless, we can, in whatever ways, keep on working to help make our family life whole, good, and growing. This week, and every new week that God gives us. 